morning, everybody. We're going to continue along into uh, chapter 9 here. I thought we'd start with the summary of kind of getting into valence bond theory um, of, of kind of just a reminder of what it is, what we're trying to do here. So we're trying to describe in valence bond theory when we have like a single bond between two atoms, it's really easy to describe this bond here because I could just think, well, what's the largest orbital of hydrogen? It's a 1s orbital. What's the largest orbital of fluorine? It would be a 2s, uh, excuse me, a 2p orbital. So we'd have a 1s, 2p overlapping set of orbitals. And so then if I think chlorine, chlorine bond, I'm just again thinking, what's the largest orbital of chlorine? So I just kind of look at chlorine's configuration. I would say its largest orbital is a 3p. So I get this 3p, 3p overlap. So I get 3p, 3p overlap to describe the bond in something like chlorine, chlorine. So I can describe a single bond between two atoms um, by the overlapping of their largest atomic orbitals. But then what do I do in a central atom like BEH2 or BEF2 or something like that? So in beryllium, say, H2, I have a beryllium atom that needs to pair up with hydrogen. And then what I want is I want there to be two orbitals on beryllium to be able to overlap with each one of the hydrogens. So instead of taking the largest orbital of beryllium, which is just one orbital, the 2s orbital, one orbital can overlap with one other orbital. So I can't really overlap twice with one orbital. So I need two different orbitals. And so I take an s and a p from beryllium and hybridize those together to come up with sp orbital number one and then the sp orbital number two. So I come up with two sp orbitals. And so I have like the one sp orbital, the other sp orbital. And so now I have two orbitals that can overlap with hydrogen. So I can get the one s. The orbitals aren't drawn to size here to scale really well, but I get the 1s of hydrogen overlapping with the sp orbital of beryllium. Uh, carbon dioxide will do this too. So anytime I have a linear molecule, it's the central atom is going to be sp hybridized. So if I have carbon double bond oxygen, we'll need to talk about what's going on with the double bonds. But what carbon needs to do is we need to put one electron here, one electron here, and we're almost going to put the other electrons like in p orbitals, the unused p orbitals, that can then make bonds with oxygen. And so we're going to see oxygen can kind of pair up as well because we know oxygen has sort of two pairs of electrons and needs to make that double bond. So we can look at the oxygen atoms and see that they're probably going to be sp2 hybridized. Like anytime I have like three domains about a central atom, then I can see the hybridization as something like an sp2 hybrid. And when I have sp hybridization, what you're kind of doing is you're taking the, for say beryllium, the central um, s orbital, and then one of the three p orbitals, and you're leaving behind two p orbitals that are just left over. So for beryllium, we'd have like a p orbital here, and then a p orbital here that just simply aren't doing anything, that they're not needed for anything. But we can use those orbitals for extra bonds and things like CO2. We can use those for multiple bonds. We'll see those in the next couple slides. Uh, for beryllium chloride, if we're looking at, say, BCl3, uh, where we know the molecule's trigonal planar, we know we need 120 degree bond angles. So why don't we just make up orbitals on boron that give us those proper bond angles? And so for BCl3, let me sketch it here. It's like if I know boron needs to end up with three pairs of electrons and roughly 120 degree bond angles, because that's the geometry that the molecule takes, then I'm going to need one, two, three atomic orbitals on boron to mix together to make those three now hybridized orbitals. And so that's where we get sp2. So I take one s orbital and then two of the p orbitals. So I take three atomic orbitals, mix them together. And again, this isn't mathematics. This is just like hokey science. This is just a model that we use to come up with to try to describe the bonding in BCl3 so that we can get overlap with a chlorine atom. And so the electrons here can overlap together. So the largest orbital of chlorine would be like a 3p. So I get 3p overlapping with an sp2 on boron three times. So I still need like a lone pair to pair up with another lone pair. So I still need there to be like the idea that we're kind of like clicking electrons together to make these bonds. And so that's why I'm taking the largest kind of orbital that's still unfilled on chlorine and then making this bond here. So I make three uh, bonds that are uh, with the sp2 hybrid on the central boron atom. And then whenever I have a tetrahedral molecule, the central atom can just be uh, an sp3 hybrid where I hybridize 
all three of the orbitals. So it's like for CH4, if I'm gonna have a central carbon, and then I want there to be four electrons, and I know they need to be in that tetrahedral kind of uh, position, so why not just create orbitals on carbon in those directions to sort of hold on to those electrons, and then we can pair up with something like hydrogens to make our molecule CH4. Now we know CH4 is already tetrahedral, that's not a surprise, but this is just giving us orbitals to give us the overlap that we would expect according to valence bond theory. So the idea of hybrid orbital theory is if the atoms don't naturally have orbitals where you need them, just make them up. Just make up some hybrid orbitals, but the only key would be the maximum number of hybrid orbitals we can get is the base number of orbitals or the available number of orbitals an atom has. So like carbon has the 2s, 2px, 2py, 2pz, so second row atoms have four orbitals, so we can have up to an sp3 hybridization, nothing higher. Uh, we can have an sp2 hybrid leaving behind a p orbital and not hybridizing one of the p's, or we can leave behind two of the p orbitals and have like an sp hybrid. So for like the boron trichloride molecule, we'd have an orbital sticking straight out of the boron that's unhybridized, that doesn't do anything. But now when I'm thinking of like this molecule H2CO, when I'm thinking of like formaldehyde, and I know it needs this trigonal planar geometry, that I'm going to want to have an sp2 hybrid here as well. And so I put three electrons on carbon into these sp2 hybrid orbitals. And then we're going to see a better picture for this in a later slide, but I'm going to use that leftover orbital, put an electron in it. I'm going to use oxygen's leftover p orbital and create another bond here. So we're going to see that we create multiple bonds. So multiple bonds, we're going to see use a a type of bonding we call pi bonding. So let's get into what pi bonding is. Before I move on, let me mention NH3 real quick. So NH3, we can have a lone pair of electrons. We know this molecule is tetrahedral domain. So what matters is our electron domain geometry. So if we have an electron domain geometry, a tetrahedral for something like NH3 with an electron pair, that NH3 is sp3 hybridized and then we'd have overlap with 1s orbitals on hydrogen to make that bond. So we can describe bonds by the hybrid orbitals of the central atom with then the largest atomic orbital of the atom that's attached to it. So we'd have like an sp3 1s bond for ammonia. Okay, now let's get a better picture of what's going on in multiple bonding. So if I look at C2H4, C2H4, what hybridization would you want to use for that carbon? If you're thinking hybridization, think domains. So think one, two, three total domains. Three total domains is trigonal planar. And then the hybridization set that we use for trigonal planar is sp2. So to come up with three domains, I need to use three atomic orbitals. So if I picture the, and the reason why we do this right is that if you imagine your orbital set, you have orbitals at 90 degree bond angles. You're, 2P, your, your 2px, 2py, 2pz. But we have atoms here and here. How do we overlap? We hybridize. And so if you picture or can picture the unhybridized orbitals, they hybridize together. So the purple orbitals are showing us the sp2 on one of the carbon atoms. So that's showing us orbitals in 120 degree bond angles relative to each other. And then the other carbon does the exact same thing. So the other carbon, of course, is sp2 as well because it's also trigonal planar. And so then if you notice in the middle, we get that sp2, sp2 overlap. So the hybrid orbitals here are overlapping to make one of the bonds. And so that's our sp2, sp2 overlap. And so anytime we have bond that's on the bond axis, if we're having a bond that's symmetrical about the bond axis, we call it a sigma bond. And so this is a sigma bond. The hydrogen atoms overlap, those make a sigma bond. So we get sigma bonds with the hydrogens with those hybrid orbitals. So the hybrid orbitals are making sigma bonds because those orbitals are on the bond axis of those bonds. And then the leftover orbital, so imagine we have an electron um, in those leftover p orbitals, which for like BCL3, no electrons went into that orbital. So for BCL3, we didn't need to put anything into those orbitals. But here I have two more electrons. I need to make one more bond, so we make this pi bond. So the pi bond's made by the leftover p orbitals overlapping together. And so this bond here, notice that it looks fundamentally different in nature than the sigma bonds because it's now like a planar bond instead of a bond axis symmetric bond. So think linear symmetric sigma 
planar symmetric. So this is a planar bond, and so this is a pi bond. And so that's our pi bond. So our unhybridized p orbitals can make uh, pi bonds. And so when I'm looking at the bonding in this molecule, I can see I have a total of one, two, three, four, five sigma bonds plus one pi bond. So like a double bond is two different types of bonds. It's the sigma, the sp2, sp2 overlap, and it's the, the p orbital unhybridized overlap left over. So it's like two different types of bonds. So our double bond is one sigma plus a pi. And so if we look at something like C2H2, we say, well, what, what if you have a triple bond? So C2H2 is hydrogen connected to carbon, connected to carbon to hydrogen. Remember, hydrogen doesn't bridge, so the two carbons have to bridge the molecule together. I have a total of, of 8 plus 2, so 10 electrons. So I go with a triple bond between the two carbon atoms. So with the triple bond between the two carbons, now how do I describe the bond here? Well, the bonding of the two carbons should now be sp hybridized because they're linear. Linear, I have two domains, so domain one, domain two. So each of the carbons are linear. The bond angle should be perfectly 180. And so if I have sp hybridization, what that means is I hybridize, you know, just, you know, each atom has an s and three p orbitals. So we take one of the s, or the only s, and one of the three p orbitals hybridize them together, I'm going to pick the p orbital that was already in the axis of the molecule, right? So the axis of the bond p orbital we, we pick to hybridize with the other carbon atom. And then we leave behind the other two p orbitals, that one's vertical, one's sticking straight out of the molecule. So I leave behind the unhybridized orbitals. But think about how carbon, what it's doing is it's trying to move its electrons around into orbitals kind of like this. It's like trying to move two of them to here and then one to here and then one to stick straight out. So we can get this pi bond here, we can get this pi bond here, and we can make sigma bonds on either side. And so our carbon-carbon triple bond, uh, we have the one sigma with the hydrogen, we get the sigma between the carbon-carbon bonds, this is our sp-sp overlap, and then we get our sigma over here, and then we get our two pi bonds, which is, you know, maybe the three dimensions makes it hard to see, but literally just overlapping the p orbitals this direction and then this direction. And so those p orbitals, what they're doing, electrons repel each other, right? So like we can't just keep putting electrons here. We can't put two electrons here, then another two electrons here. So we put two electrons here, then we put two electrons here, then we put two electrons here. It's a way that these molecules are finding a way to best utilize the space that surrounds them. So like if you're picturing the molecule, it's like, okay, we're putting electrons between the nuclei, and then we're making these pi type bonds and the same thing sticking straight out of the page. So if you can picture it, if you can try to think of sketching it, hopefully we can imagine what's going on here where the bonding in uh, C2H2, we have one, two, three sigma bonds in total, and then we have the two pi bonds. So a double bond is a sigma and a pi. We see a triple bond is a sigma and two pi bonds, just by the nature of the overlapping of those orbitals. Okay, so the bonding here, again, if the bond, if the electrons are being placed symmetrical about the nuclei of the bond, so if these are, are carbon nuclei, then that's what makes that be a sigma bond. And then if the bond is sort of perpendicular or planar, uh, uh, in the plane that surrounds the bond axis where these are our carbon nuclei, then that's what we call and consider to be a pi bond. And so we can break bonding down just looking at a Lewis structure. So the bond here for hydrogen, that's a sigma bond. The carbon-carbon double and acetylene, again, the, just the double bond would be the sigma plus a pi. And if we're looking at nitrogen, you can say each nitrogen is sp hybridized. And then we have the sp orbital in the middle for the sigma bond, and then the two pi from the leftover p orbitals. So we'd have a sigma plus two pi from this type of picture of bonding for N2. And so nitrogen triple bond, again, a sigma plus two pi bonds. And then we'd have lone pair residing in the uh, sp hybrid orbitals. So a quick summary, uh, and this is a little bit of what, what was being summarized at the start of class, but I just wanted to make sure that we're on the same page with some of the concepts from Monday's lecture that when we're looking at hybridization, it's as simple as saying if the molecule's linear, if we know the geometry of the molecule's linear from Vesper theory, then we know that should be sp hybridization. 
So we hybridize an S and a P orbital. We call it SP hybridization. Um, an example would be like BEF2, CO2 would be another example. Uh, we didn't actually look at CO2. Maybe I'll do CO2 in a minute in terms of what it looks like. It has an interesting uh, way its orbitals overlap. But CO2 fits this type of pattern. I don't know why they mentioned um, uh, the, the mercury compound, HGCl2. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Um, so I think that's a silly example to throw in here. Uh, we'll look at CO2 um, after this slide here. But whenever we have trigonal planar, again, that's we have to hy hybridize an S and three P orbitals because I need to come up with three um, hybrid orbitals. So to get three hybrid orbitals, I start with three atomic orbitals. So that's SP2 hybridization. And then anytime I have a central atom that's tetrahedral, then that's SP3 hybridization. I hybridize all three of the P orbitals, leave none of them left over for pi bonding. So let's talk about CO2 for a minute in terms of the bonds here. So if I'm thinking of CO2, for CO2, again, I'm picturing SP hybridization. And we were talking earlier SP2 for the oxygens. But let's think about the sort of way these o orbitals overlap together. So carbon, again, picture how we're going to have SP hybrid, or excuse me, yeah, SP hybridization here. And then I'm going to have a leftover P orbital in this direction. And then for a moment, I'm not going to sketch the other leftover P orbital that's sticking straight out of the page. And so think about how this oxygen here is going to want to put these two electrons like in the plane going back and coming straight out of the page so that it has this orbital with an electron sticking straight up. Like the orbitals like want to overlap. Like we don't want this P orbital on oxygen sticking out of the plane. We want it to flip up so it can overlap. So if it flips up, notice how it's going to take the electron pairs on oxygen and have them sticking in and out of the plane of the molecule. And so these electron pairs here are coming out and then going back. And so then if you think of the other orbital on carbon that's unhybridized, that's sticking straight out of the carbon atom, now that can line up with the orbital on oxygen that would be in that same kind of general direction. And so we can have CO2 make its two pi bonds. So each of the double bonds in CO2 should be a sigma and a pi. And so we get our sp sp2 overlap. So the sigmas, we'd say that's sp sp2 overlap. And then the um, oxygen atoms have two electrons in sp2 orbitals. And then they're each using their leftover p orbital to make a pi bond. And they're just using one in this direction here and the other in this direction here. So it's kind of just showing you how CO2 can use one pi bond in this direction to make a second pi bond in the other direction. So we have two pi bonds, one sticking straight out of the page, one in the plane of the page. Not a big detail, but you can kind of uh, try to picture how the uh, atoms are using their orbitals and trying to use space to make these different types of orbitals. All right. Now, some of the questions you see in this topic are really, I think, pretty straightforward. So this is a fairly common type question, which is accounting sigma and pi bonds in a molecule, which is really as simple uh, when it says, how many total sigma and pi bonds does the molecule contain? Our sigma is just 1, 2, 3 for the double, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Right? Because each of the double bonds is a sigma plus a pi, and the triples are a sigma plus a pi. So every type of bond that there is in the molecule is a sigma. So that gives me 9. Let me erase those marks. So I can see then the pi count. I should have one pi here, one pi here, and then two pi bonds here. So that gives me a total of four pi bonds. So again, I should have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sigma and then the one, two, three, four pi bonds. So it's just really counting singles are one sigma, doubles are sigma and a pi, and triples are one sigma and two pi. And if you forget, is it two sigma and one pi or one sigma and two pi, just think of how the bonding goes. It's just these atoms here are sp hybridized in terms of the c and the n. And then that leaves behind two p orbitals to make those pi bonds. So the unhybridized two p orbitals in those <coughs> atoms make those two pi bonds. This, this next question is kind of similar. Like I think I meant to delete the previous example and then just have this slide here. Um, so this slide is kind of asking us to consider
um, the same type of question as the previous page and the same molecules on it. But also, we could start with like kind of like a base molecule where, where we can give you a, a formula and we can piece together that this molecule, which looks like acetic acid, would be, you know, the CH3. And we can sketch the Lewis structure. Now I have a carbon, and I have an oxygen on both sides. And then oxygen should have two lone pairs and two bonds. So I could come up with the Lewis structure using the ideas that we were talking about uh, last time. If you remember, carbon likes to form molecules with four bonds, no lone pairs. Oxygen likes to have uh, bonds with two bonds and two lone pairs. And so I get that with a double bond with the one oxygen and then two single bonds with the other oxygen atom. And so now if I'm thinking of bond angles, I can think, or hybridization as well, that this carbon's sp3, this carbon's sp2, and then the bond here, sp3 is tetrahedral, so these bond angles are closer to 109.5 degrees. I'm not trying to say I sketch them to look like that, but that's what the real bond angles would be in the molecule. So the molecule of acetic acid would look more like this. So oftentimes we'll sketch a two-dimensional Lewis structure and then have to interpret shape from it. So I might have something that looks like this is the real shape of the molecule. These bond angles here are closer to 120 because we have a trigonal planar sp2 carbon for the carbon-oxygen double bond part of the molecule, so that's sp2. And then in terms of the sigma bonding, we'd have a total of what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sigma bonds. And then just the one pi. So we could identify sp3 versus sp2 versus sp. We can identify bond angles. We can do the bond angles just with Vesper too. The bond angles don't necessarily like, need us to understand the hybridization set. But they all go hand in hand. The hybridization goes hand in hand with the geometry, which goes hand in hand with the bond angles. And then maybe in the example, and we can also count sigma and pi bonds. And so in the molecule we looked at in the previous example, we can kind of go through and sort of identify that that oxygen might be described as an sp3 center, sp2, sp2 for these atoms here, and then sp. So we can identify the hybridization set. And again, it's just linear as sp. Trigonal planar is sp2, tetrahedral sp3, and so I'm just looking at the number of domains, four for this atom for sp3, bond angle here, 109.5, maybe a little less because of the lone pair repulsions. We might even be able to look at this bond angle here, two singles, 120, maybe even a little less than 120. This bond angle here, about 120, maybe slightly greater because the double bond repulsions are a little greater than the single bond repulsions. So we can break down bond angles too the linear bond angle perfectly 180. So we can break bond angles down, we can break the structure down, we can go from Lewis structure uh, in two dimensions to a thought of shape in three dimensions. Okay, so then the other, one of, one of the other topics that we can make sense of is a picture that we were showing you guys back in chapter eight, which was what delocalized bonding looks like. So when we were talking about the bonding and things like nitrate, when we had a Lewis structure that looked like this, and we were talking about how resonance takes place where the electron pairs at all times are resonating through the molecule, through these different types of orbitals, and then you could imagine um, the third Lewis structure looking like this here. So this is probably not the biggest detail to count the number of electrons involved here. But we have a total of six um, electrons in this pi system. In the pi system, we can now make sense of what we mean by pi system. I think I mentioned the word pi system back in chapter eight, and we probably didn't know what we were meaning by pi system, but it's those like, those um, sort of planar type bonds that are forming from the overlapping of those unhybridized p orbitals. So if you imagine we have the double bond here, I'd have an orbital that's unhybridized on that oxygen. If I hybridize it over to here, draw this orbital, I'd have a leftover p orbital in that atom as well. I could have all of those unhybridized p orbitals simultaneously overlap, where that one orbital just gets two electrons to spread out across all of those bonds at the exact same time. So the idea of resonance is that the electrons are never here, let me use a different color, they're never here, they're never here, and they're never there, they're always spread across the whole molecule. So it gives you a molecular picture of how it's possible for a molecule 
to kind of adopt the average structure of all of the Lewis structures we may have sketched. So just remember, just because we sketch a Lewis structure with a double bond doesn't compel the molecule to exist with the double bond. The reality is all those orbitals can simultaneously overlap and make one pi orbital. So we make just you know, one pi orbital with those two electrons in it, the two bonding electrons. So the net number of bonding electrons there that we're putting, we're still just sharing that one extra bond so we're putting the two pi bond, uh, bonding electrons into that one orbital, and that's how we were coming up with the bond order as being about four thirds. So we can make sense of some things like the, the number of delocalized um, electrons is two. So the number of electrons that are delocalizing on average at any time are two, but there's six electrons involved in that process overall. So we got two delocalized pi electrons, six total electrons in the pi system. I don't think they're ever going to ask you to give those counts. But you can try to picture that that's what we kind of mean or what we're kind of looking at in calculating things like average bond orders and trying to think of what the average bond length might be reflective of. Let's look at benzene. This is probably a molecule you'll see a lot in OCHEM. And so this molecule here has carbon atoms at all the vertices. And anybody who's had any organic chemistry um, or if you haven't had any organic chemistry, anytime you see a vertice in OCHEM where there's no atom indicated, that's always assumed to be carbon. And then you would have the required number of hydrogens to get the carbon up to four total bonds. And so sketching something like this, this structure here is a very common way you'll be writing benzene next year um, if you take OCHEM. And we're just picturing that each of the vertices has a carbon atom and then again, a hydrogen to give each of those carbons four total bonds. But the bigger detail for now is to see that these are resonance structures. So I have resonance take place when I can sketch structure A and structure B and then notice that they're identical to each other, yet different from each other. So they're identical, yet different to each other. So the real molecule exists as the hybrid. And so what does the hybrid look like? Well, if you picture the carbon atoms like in the plane of the room or the plane that I'm picturing here, all these p orbitals would be sticking straight up out of the molecule. So if you picture a delocalized bond here, one here, one here, which is trying to be shown in this structure here, if you imagine the um, sort of bonds, if we move the electrons over, if you just move these electrons over to here in these Lewis structures, you get then the localized picture number B. So those structures are the same as each other. So the real molecule just finds a way to put all of those electrons into one orbital. So we get one, well, it ends up being more than one orbital, but that's a deeper picture that you'll see later. But you have a bonding system where those bonding electrons are going to a set of orbitals where they're being shared across the molecule at all times. And so what that does is, is it gives you a picture of what the delocalized molecule looks like. So delocalize is spread out. So it's the spreading out of the electrons across the whole molecule at all times. And the localized picture is what we're showing you here. So this is what it would look like to be localized. And the molecule never really looks like the localized picture. Like that's the hardest thing to, to maybe understand and comprehend is just because we can sketch A, just because we can sketch B, doesn't compel the molecule to exist as A and B and go back and forth. It doesn't do that. It exists at all times as the average. It exists at all, at, at all times as the composite. And so the next slide, a couple of questions that you might see on something like this, which is, you know, you can see that there's six carbon-carbon bonds across the molecule. And so if we're counting here, we get six bonds across the molecule. And then we have two different resonance structures we can sketch that are identical to each other. For a lot of molecules that only have one one structure, if there's only one Lewis structure, then you can picture resonance as just, well, the only, there's no resonance when you just have one. If you have two or more, then the molecule can resonate those electrons through the molecule. The average bond order is how we can see that these bonds average out to not be a single or a double, but to be the average of that. So what we're doing in the real molecule that looks more like this is we're taking the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine bonding pairs of electrons, and we're spreading them across the six bonds. So I have six carbon-carbon bonds, and I have nine bonding pairs of electrons. 
We have the bonding pairs and we have the six bonds. And that gives us an average bond order of 1.5, which should be right in between the length you would expect for a single versus a double bond. And so if you remember single bonds longer, double bonds shorter, the benzene bond length should be right in the middle. And so are all the carbon-carbon bond lengths and benzene equal in length? Yes, that's exactly what resonance does. We don't have one of the two, three of the bonds shorter, three of them longer. They're all at all times the same length. And then how many electrons are in the de delocalized pi system? So how many electrons are involved in this pi system? Well, it's the electrons we're moving around. It's the two, four, six electrons. So I have six pi system electrons. And then there's six electrons delocalized as well. So in this picture, for this molecule, we get the same count. So six electrons in the pi system, and all six of those electrons are delocalized. But I threw this together just to do a quick comparison of, you know, just, to, you know, because it's like a double check to make sure the model's right, because I mentioned before that these are all just models, and most models are incomplete or maybe wrong, but they, they can have something about them that you can make sense of. And so I think what these models get right is they get right the prediction of the bond link trends. So a carbon-carbon single bond like an ethane has a distance of 1.54 angstrom. The carbon-carbon double bond in ethylene is 1.34 angstrom. And benzene's kind of just about in the middle, 1.39 angstrom. So where you'd expect to find um, a one and a half bond would be somewhere between the bond link for single versus double. Uh, there's more to bonding than just the bond order, though, so that's why it's not perfectly in the middle. And then the carbon-carbon triple bond, just to kind of make sure we're complete, a triple bond a lot shorter than the double bond. Okay, so just making sure that the prediction of the bond order makes some sense with the reality of the bond lengths of the real molecules. Okay, now we'd almost be done, other than we're going to see in a couple slides from now, that there's a key molecule, it's oxygen. Oxygen has a property that we wouldn't have expected with any bonding model to this point. So I think the task that we have is to try to understand a slightly more complete picture of what goes on in bonding. And that ends up involving the, the concepts of molecular orbital theory. And so molecular orbital theory is kind of a different type of uh, picture of bonding. It's similar in some regard to valence bond theory and that it involves the overlapping of orbitals. But it gives us a second picture and that is, if you think of like just a physics concept, that if you have um, something that you stabilize, you have to have something that you destabilize. And so if we're going to stabilize an orbital, if we're going to overlap, say, two electrons in the 1s orbitals of hydrogen to make a bonding orbital for the H2 molecule, so we make this bonding orbital, that sigma bond we expected from the 1s orbitals. So we kind of get the same overlap picture we did for valence bond theory. But then we get this picture here that there must be some destabilized orbital that we would call the antibonding orbital. And so that we call the sigma star. So the notation here for antibonding, the orbitals that go up relative to their atomic orbitals that they're comprised of, as the energy goes upward, and we call these antibonding orbitals. And as luck would have it, or just as you might imagine, that if you go down by x, then you go up by more than x. So by however much you go down in energy, so if the, the bond goes down by, say, 435 kJs per mole, the antibonding orbital is going to be greater than 435 kJs per mole upward. You know, so the stabilization you get is never going to be more than the destabiliz destabilization you get by the antibonding orbitals. So just to sort of get the idea, if you go down, you're going to go up by a little bit more. Um, and so the antibonding orbitals go upward relative to their starting point. Now this gives us a picture, and I think we had a pretty good picture from valence bond theory on why helium wouldn't overlap with itself to make a bond. Because if you remember, I think I mentioned how you need there to be room for the electrons to overlap. To get, it's not just about the orbital overlap, but it's also about the unpaired electrons and then um, having the right count and needing to share electrons still. So if we picture helium and think about the difference between H2, why it exists, and helium-2, why it doesn't exist, helium-2 has a total of, or if it existed, would have a total of four electrons, H2 only two electrons. And so if I'm thinking of my uh, molecular orbital diagram, if you will, if I'm thinking of my diagram where the lowest energy orbitals are at the bottom, the higher energy orbitals at the top, H2 has the perfect number in the bonding orbital, I have two bonding electrons, and then helium-2 would have two in a bonding orbital and two in an antibonding orbital. 
And then the, uh, the, the net balance here would be how much energy we gained here is never going to be matched. It's going to be exceeded by the destabilization of those electrons that we put into the antibonding orbital. So meaning for things to form, we usually want to take the helium and have there be some energy benefit downward in energy. The benefit for helium, there's no benefit. It would cost energy for it to overlap to make these orbitals. So therefore, it never exists as helium-2. So helium-2 doesn't exist as a molecule. Now, one way you can see this is if you try to calculate the bond order. So the bond order, you would say H2, just looking at the, the Lewis structure, you would say, well, that's a single bond, and that's a bond order of one. Now, from a MO diagram, if you're counting electrons, you could take the sum of the bonding electrons and then subtract the antibonding electrons. And so for H2, we have two bonding electrons and we have zero antibonding electrons, so we get a bond order of one, just like we would have predicted. Now, the reason for the half in front is because when we calculate bond orders from like an MO diagram, a lot of time we're counting electrons, not electron pairs. And so a single bond shares two electron pairs. And so if you're counting electrons, you would say, well, two electrons times a half to go to one. So you're multiplying by a half just to cut the pairs, or just cut the total electrons into pairs. So we're just pairing up those electrons. So we have one bonding pair of electrons for H2. And if you compare this for helium-2, or the, the sort of prototype for what helium-2 might look like, we'd have a half and then two bonding minus two anti-bonding, so zero. And so we get no bond. So the meaning of a zero bond order is that there's no stable bond that would form between two helium atoms. So helium-2 doesn't exist in the way that H2 exists. Okay, so we can use um, MO theory to help us understand why um, some molecules don't exist, but yeah, I think you could also see there's really no room for electrons and helium too. I think we have a pretty good picture of why it doesn't exist from our other theories as well. And so then the picture comes for O2. So, and th we could have led with this too, because I think this is, if not for this picture here, and I once did this as a demo, and I think it's to me the most boring demo to do, because like you can literally try to pour um, liquid oxygen across a magnet and see that it sticks to the magnet. And this whole sticking here takes place for like a second or two. It's really hard to see if you actually try to do the demo. But this is a really uh, fascinating property for oxygen because if you're thinking of O2 from every one of our bonding models, do you think O2 has any unpaired electrons? Probably not. Like no, the, these electrons look spin paired. Like if we're even thinking of this from like valence bond theory and hybrid theory, you might be saying, okay, these are probably both sp2 hybrids and the lone pairs are in sp2 orbitals, which those would be spin paired. For a molecule to be attracted into a magnetic field, we need there to be net spin. We need there to be unpaired electrons. So where are the unpaired electrons? Well, the answer is the structures here are kind of incomplete. Like we haven't really thought of why, what it would mean for the electrons to be paired versus unpaired. So let's look at a more complete bonding model to try to understand why oxygen, each of them ends up, it's maybe hard to see, but these are oxygen atoms. We have two electrons that are gonna be paired together on average. So we're gonna have two unpaired electrons on each O2 molecule. So we need to get that property right. So if our bonding model doesn't show us a structure, a Lewis structure, doesn't show us a hybrid orbital picture of oxygen with unpaired electrons, well, let's look to a model that can show us where those unpaired electrons are coming from so we can understand, one, what it would mean like to come up with a model to show us those unpaired electrons and then see what else we can learn about other molecules um, at the same time. And you may also question other details that we've come to know if those are right. We're going to see most of the things that we've learned from structure and, and the Lewis theory, hybrid orbital theory, most of the like lessons we've learned are true. So like we're not going to see too many differences other than really seeing why oxygen ends up with unpaired electrons. Okay, so let's start with the kind of next, if we start hydrogen helium, let's go lithium two, beryllium two. Now in terms of dilithium or diberyllium, you know, these aren't compounds that tend to exist as diatomic molecules, but you can sort of get the idea of just thinking of how, if they did exist, like you could get them to exist maybe in the gas phase to do some experiments. 
even though maybe they don't exist as a gaseous stable molecule. So you can get them to form and overlap and get some of their properties. Lithium-2 has a 1s2 and 2s1 configuration. And really, we should just focus on the valence orbitals. Like, I don't necessarily know, other than getting us to think that there are um, inner shell orbitals, uh, but it's really going to be the valence orbitals that are more involved in the bonding in this molecule. So we have the 1s2, 2s1. And so you can imagine the inner orbitals, if you're picturing the two lithiums, it's like you have the 1s orbitals and the 2s. And you have lithium here, and then you have the other lithium, and you have the 1s and the 2s. So obviously you're going to get the best overlap between the biggest orbitals, and you're going to get maybe a small amount of overlap between the 1s orbitals. And so I think to scale, this is really shown to be too big. You know, I think you're gonna get a tiny bit of bonding and anti-bonding in the 1S, so much so that once we get to the next group of atoms, you're gonna see that we'll just leave off the inner core orbital. So you just get a little bit of downward, a little bit of upward for the sigma 1S, sigma star 1S. So just in terms of the nomenclature here, a sigma bond, we're getting the overlap between the nucleus of the, or between the bond axis of the molecules between the 1s orbitals, and if it's bonding, there's no symbol, and if it's anti-bonding, you get the star symbol. And then we get the bonding sigma 2s, because we're now involving the orbitals that are larger, they overlap together to more bonding and anti-bonding character, but the 2s orbital is just a lot higher in energy than the 1s. So our energy is going upward um, on our axis here, so the 2s just starts off higher in energy, and so we get our sigma 2s and our sigma star 2s. And so then for lithium-2, we're just putting in three electrons each. So we're just putting two, four, six electrons in. And so if we were to calculate a bond order for lithium-2, it would be a half. And then we have four bonding electrons. So I have these two electrons here and those two electrons. And then these are anti-bonding electrons. So my net bond order is single. Now, let's think about bonding versus anti-bonding um, a, a little bit more. And maybe I didn't highlight this as much from the previous example. But the bonding orbitals, where if you picture two electrons in like a 1s or the 2s, it's where the electrons are bringing the nuclei together and they're meeting in the middle. We call that constructive interference. So when you're looking at the bonding orbitals, these result from uh, constructive interference. And the orbitals, like you have lithium and lithium, the, the maximum density is being placed in between the nucleus of the atoms, so we're finding the greatest probability between the two atoms. And the anti-bonding orbitals are putting the electrons far away. So the anti-bonding orbital, which we don't have to use for lithium-2, would kind of look like this, where our greatest density is far away from the nucleus. And then we'd have a node in the middle where there's a point of no probability, and there's really low probability of finding an anti-bonding electron between the nuclei. So the bonding orbitals are trying to bring the nuclei together. The anti-bonding orbitals are trying to break the, uh, the bond. And so if you think, let me, anytime I go back, it doesn't work well with the, the video. All right, so I'm gonna stay on the side here. So if we're thinking of like hydrogen, so hydrogen brings the 1s orbitals together. So let's, let's think of the hydrogen atom and its diagram um, a little bit more in a little bit more detail. So let's go back to H2 for a minute. So for H2, you have the 1s orbitals. You bring them together to make the sigma 1s. And the picture of this, we didn't really think too much about the picture on the, the slide for this, is that the picture of what this orbital is doing is you have the greatest probability of finding the electron in this region here. So your shading would be the greatest in between the nuclei. And this is what bonding looks like. We call that constructive interference. Constructive interference, I like to think of almost, if you imagine the electron spinning, it's where the electrons are kind of meeting in the middle of this molecule, and they both spin in the opposite directions. You have one spinning one direction, the other spinning the other direction. So this is where the electrons are just meeting up between the nuclei. If you think about where the other electrons would be, if there were more electrons, they'd be on the periphery of the molecule. So what the antibonding orbital would look like is where the electrons are now over here and over here. So we're getting the greatest probability of finding the electrons now far away from the nucleus, again, with that node in the middle. And so our antibonding orbital is trying to break the bond we just tried to make. So the average of bonding and antibonding is either in the case like helium-2, 
of the result of no bonding at all ends up taking place. And then we'll also see that it could result for other molecules to be what we think of as lone pairs. So we're going to see that for some larger molecules, we'll start to think of the effect of bonding, canceling out with antibonding, is just the concept of what lone pairs are doing. Okay, so let's get into some larger molecules. So um, let, let's think about things that have um, you know, 2s and 2p orbitals. So this is getting closer to something that looks like oxygen. Um, so let's think about, um, let's think about O2 actually. Let's just, let's just do the whole point of this lesson first and think about oxygen in terms of what its diagram might look like and then what some of the orbitals might look like for the overlap. So we have the 2s orbitals come next in energy and then the 2p. So the relative energy of the 2s orbitals are lower in energy, the 2p are higher. And so if we're picturing an oxygen atom over here, another oxygen over here, we're just kind of picturing those atoms with um, uh, six valence electrons for each O. So we're picturing the valence electrons here because we have our valence orbitals. And what's going on over here in the structure is just kind of picturing the two atoms and their orbitals. And then trying to think of when the atoms approach each other, how do the orbitals overlap? So imagine you have oxygen number one flying towards oxygen number two. How, like, what do the orbitals look like here? Well, let's take a step back from these orbitals for, for a second and just imagine that you have one oxygen that has a 2s, a 2p orbital, and let's picture one of the other 2p orbitals. And then let's leave behind the one sticking straight out of the page that would complicate and really make this harder to see. Then we have the other 2s orbital in the other oxygen. We have the 2p orbital in this direction. We have the 2p orbital in this direction. And so those orbitals, unless you hybridize them, are locked into place, right? So, so you can picture the 2p, 2p overlap right away. You're going to get 2p, 2p overlap here. You're going to get the, the 2s overlap here. The orbitals probably aren't drawn to scale, so those s orbitals are probably a lot bigger. They're definitely going to overlap. And then we're going to get that pi type bonding again. So the, you can see the p orbitals here can probably start to overlap to make pi bonds. So you can see that we're kind of well situated to make sigma type bonds and to make pi type bonds. And so what we're going to get here is we're going to get the s orbitals overlapping to make the sigma bonds from those two s orbitals. And so these are going to look like a lot like the bonds from H2. Um, in helium two, so we get our bonding and our anti-bonding orbitals. And then we're going to get our sigma orbital where we put two electrons, the, the, the two p orbitals overlapping together here. So we get those orbitals um, that are next in energy and then our pi two p set of orbitals uh, coming next in terms of our pi bonding orbitals in terms of our energies. I don't think you would have necessarily predicted this um, ordering but you're gonna see that we'll give you a base diagram on the test. You don't have to memorize the order of these orbitals, but I do think they kind of make sense that the, you get the S overlapping first, then you get the P overlapping next, and you would expect, unless something happens, you'd probably expect the 2P overlap would be really strong, meaning you get really good bonding character dropping by a lot, and then increasing by a lot of energy, and then your pi bonding set. Now, the only thing with the pi bonding set is they're doubly degenerate. There's two that are identical. So whenever you see the two together, that has to be the pi set because that's going to be that pi orbital number one. So this is pi orbital number one. And then the other one we didn't sketch sticking straight out of the molecule looks identical. So we get this times two, right? There's two of those pi type bonds. So I get two pi bonding orbitals and then I get two pi anti-bonding orbitals. And then I get the sigma star anti-bonding orbital. Now, again, I don't think you need to put too much brain power into memorizing the order of this because I think somebody had to determine this ahead of us. Like, I don't think, I mean, even though it maybe looks predictable, I think you need to do some type of experimental analysis to know that this is the order of the orbitals. And, but, but the lesson would be for O2, just put 12 electrons into these orbitals. And then the reason why we're studying this topic, I think, will, will be right in front of us. So you go two, four, six. And then you try to apply Hund's rule, right? We're gonna to try to use space as effectively as possible, spin pair the electrons, but that's eight. I have four more to go. So I have to spin pair for 10, two more to go. Simple, I mean, it's like, there's the unpaired electrons. The unpaired electrons are right in this diagram here. So these are the net unpaired electrons in O2, where O2 can be drawn into a magnetic field due to having those unpaired electrons. So it has a net spin that can pull it into a magnetic field. And so any molecule that has unpaired electrons will be drawn into a magnetic field.
And so you can think here that this is a property for O2 that makes it magnetic. So it's going to be pulled into a magnetic field as a result of those two unpaired electrons. Now, I do think we have a little bit of a hard time thinking of what O2 might look like, but let's look at its bond order. So if we want to calculate the bond order of O2, just like we did for a couple other molecules, we take a half times our bonding orbitals. So, that's our bo so our bonding are the ones that go down relative to their atomic orbitals that they are comprised of. The ones that go up are the ones that um, are the antibonding orbitals. And now where the antibonding electrons are, let's look at some of these pictures over here. Um, so in case of the sigma, the, so this picture here shows us the 2p, 2p overlap gives us the bonding orbital here, and then this is our antibonding orbital on the top of it. So the antibonding orbital is putting electrons away from the nuclei. The bonding orbital is trying to bring the nuclei together to make the net bond. And so then, again, notice that the bonding electrons are winding up between the nuclei, and the antibonding orbitals are ending up on the outside of the nuclei. They're trying to break the bond that we just tried to make. So bonding electrons bring the nuclei together, antibonding orbitals trying to break the atom apart. And so for oxygen, we have a total of eight bonding electrons, and then we have a total of four antibonding electrons. So the bond order that we get double, that's right. There's nothing wrong with the bond order from our Lewis picture. But I think the only thing that we might sketch differently knowing this now, how do we sketch like a Lewis structure for O2? I would think that it probably would just be something like this. That we just have the idea that two of these electrons are spin paired, and then two of those electrons are spin unpaired relative to each other. So it's just like, you know, we needed to think a little bit more about what the lone pairs were doing in the molecule. Now where they are, how they're behaving, is still a little bit complicated because I think the, the idea of a bonding versus an antibonding electron, like if you picture the bonding and antibonding from the sigma 2s, sigma star 2s, I think that's probably these two electrons here. You know, maybe not in that specific location, but that's kind of the idea of try to make a bond, you, uh, you, you re-break it, the average of that is antibonding electrons. And then you try to make a sigma, which is really there, so you do have your sigma bond, and then you have uh, your pi bond, uh, so it's, it's such a complicated picture because it's like you have the sigma that you made between the O2s and then you get a pi bonding orbital two electrons here, pi bonding orbital two electrons here, and we break each of those bonds. We break like half of each one of those bonds with their antibonding orbitals. So it's like on average, we have two electrons here, one electron here, one electron here. So, I mean, it's such a difficult picture to look at, but the key detail I think is you get two unpaired electrons, you get the same bond order, so, so we're predicting the right bond length. We're predicting the right bond order from valence bond theory. We just didn't get a good picture of what the unpaired electrons really look like. Like, so molecular orbital theory would show us that the, the lone pairs of electrons are more complicated than we would have imagined from uh, Lewis structures and from valence bond theory. So we just needed to think a little bit more detail about what those electrons are doing. We end up with the net two unpaired electrons from the model. Okay, um, let me skip this picture for now. Let me skip that too. So let's come to this slide here and wrap up on this slide here for today. So whenever uh, we have molecules that have all their electrons spin paired, so if we picture a structure that has all of its electrons spin paired, um, like if you think of N2, like if you look at your diagram that we sketched for O2, N2 only has 10 electrons. So if you take your O2 diagram, and you like remove two electrons, you notice that we go back to having a spin unpaired molecule, or a molecule that all the electrons are spin paired, so there's no unpaired electrons in N2. So N2 is what we'd call diamagnetic. It's not gonna be pulled into a magnetic field. So diamagnetic, uh, diamagnetism is the result of all the electrons and every orbital being spin paired. These substances are actually weakly repelled by a magnetic field. They're certainly not pulled into the magnetic field. So think of diamagnetism to mean non-magnetic, not pulled into the magnetic field. And so an example here would be something like N2. And then something that's paramagnetic is the result of one or more unpaired electrons in an orbital of the molecule. If we have one plus unpaired electron, it's pulled into a magnetic field. An example would be O2. So is O2 paramagnetic or diamagnetic? It's paramagnetic according to MO theory and it is according to experiment two. So experiment show it's paramagnetic. Uh, MO theory shows it's paramagnetic. It's hard to, like, 
I think the other models would just say that they're incomplete. They weren't trying to think about what those electrons were doing in O2, um, but we don't get a complete picture with those models we do with MO theory. Now we do need to circle back and maybe look at a couple other molecules, see what else we can learn. So we'll talk about a couple examples of MO theory, and then we'll get into some review topics on Friday, um, looking ahead to next week, midterm on Tuesday. All right, guys, that's all for today. Have a great day.